Good morning, everyone. So I'm just going to jump straight into it. I've, I've chosen not to actually show you a lot of 3D printed parts, because I'm quite, quite sure you'll see quite a few of those today. So I'm actually focusing a little bit more top level around supply chain and some of the consequences of 3D printing that I find particularly fascinating. Um, but our story really starts, I think, in uh, as early as 1913. And literally 106 years ago, uh, and, and uh, two weeks, the first mass manufacturing movable assembly line was started by the Ford Motor Company. I'm sure you're all familiar with the story. Um, but the, the real innovation was moving the product along and then having teams add to the product, right? Fast forward to today, we're pretty much doing exactly the same thing when it comes to manufacturing. We're using robots instead of people. Um, actually, the, the uh, time has gone up, so it used to be using this innovation, they were able to bring their production time from 12 hours per car down to three hours per car. Now it takes about three to five days to build a Tesla. So I don't know what's going on there, but uh, that, that, that's not my problem, luckily. What is my problem, and I think everyone's problem, is that the consequence of doing centralized manufacturing, which is what we've been doing for the last century, is that you end up having to compensate for you know, having parts in a central location by creating an incredibly complex supply chain. And so, as a consequence of this, in turn, a lot of costs are added, not to the cost of production, but to the cost of getting whatever the good is being produced from A to user. And so, you know, just to give you some statistics on this, for every dollar of goods ordered today, you're looking at about $1.40 being stored in inventory. So these are billions and billions and billions of dollars of goods, literally just sitting around, um, being moved from one place to the, uh, to the other. In addition, it costs about, on top of the one dollar you use to produce a good, it costs another dollar to get the part to the customer, on average. And so, you know, on top of that, you're losing 10% of the goods uh, through obsolescence or, 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 or waste on, on the journey as well. So, you know, the, the consequence of this is we're ending up in a situation where we're producing goods centrally because it's been the most cost-effective way of doing things, but also no one really wants to car carry the inventory costs. And so if you're a manufacturer or an end user today, you're doing everything you can to sort of thin down the lean supply, uh, supply chain um, and optimize everything. But you're still stuck in this traditional supply chain space where at the end of the day, you're still trying to send physical goods from one side of the world to the other. Now, enter 3D printing. So 3D printing has been around for, since the 80s. Uh, I came onto the scene in, in January of 2012. Uh, I'd married an American, moved to San Francisco, and lo and behold, my neighbor was building his own 3D printer. And we started a company called Taipei Machines uh, early on in 2012. And when we started, we were one of 14 companies building, quite frankly, pieces of shit, uh, plywood constructions, um, but the revolution at the time was, you know, we were one of 14 companies doing this, but we were building product that was a $1,200 piece of equipment when, you know, just a couple of years earlier, the cheapest 3D printer you could get in the market was $60,000. It was a significant change. And of course, you know, we didn't stay at plywood. We've actually evolved the industry quite a lot since. And where we're at right now is, um, 3D printing is getting to the point where we can actually get the right quality, get the right cost structure down. And one of the big trends that I'm very excited about is that we're also moving from having big sort of mainframe 3D printers to actually having distributed manufacturing capabilities, meaning that the quality of a part that you can build on a desktop system for just a couple of thousand dollars now is getting to the point where it's good enough for end usage. Now, that has some really big consequences because it means that instead of having a $400,000 piece of equipment that you kind of have to use in a central facility, now you can have number, you know, hundreds of two to $3,000 machines out closer to the end user. And this is a trend that I believe is going to continue. Robots and production robots in particular are getting faster, better, and cheaper all the time. And as a consequence, why don't we move production closer to the end user? There are some benefits to this. 
one of the big benefits is that, you know, by sending files rather than parts around the world, we're able to radically reduce the environmental footprint on the goods that are being sent. Uh, and additionally, you can reduce time and also cost. And so the sort of future that we are envisioning is very much a local mass customers production. In many ways, we're moving back to the medieval society, you know, uh, both in terms of information sharing, everyone knows everything about everyone in the village, and also in terms of production, you can go to your local blacksmith and get whatever it is that you need done. Um, this has been done in other industries. Essentially, what we are doing is we're turning a hardware problem, long supply chains, high cost of inventory, into a software and services opportunity. And that's why I started the Valdi in 2016, uh, basically with the idea of trying to send files rather than parts. And really what it is is just simplifying the supply chain, making it more simple, local, and on demand, and radically reducing the complexity of the supply chain, essentially by cutting out FedEx. FedEx is not very happy about this, or other you know, um, intermediaries. The way we went about doing this is we teamed up uh, and focused in on the maritime industry. Why the maritime industry? Well, aerospace and automotive is kind of done in 3D printing. There's a lot of companies doing amazing things in aerospace and automotive. But with the maritime, uh, it's a very traditional industry. Um, and also, you have a huge supply chain problem, not necessarily due to you know, complexity of parts so you want to reduce the weight or anything, but you've got basically vessels that on average, live, have a lifespan of 21 years, moving targets around the world, and you're trying to get parts to them on the time frame, getting them through customs. And of course, every single vessel is unique, meaning that um, they're, none of them really use the same equipment. So the average vessel spends about $161,000 a year on just spare parts alone. It's a huge problem for them to be able to get them through. And of course, if you don't get the right parts on time, then your vessel gets stuck in port, and it's a $26,000 a day fee just to be stuck in port. So, you know, one thing is being able to, to, to reduce just the cost of the supply chain, but there are other additional costs as well that we're seeing are very, very interesting to dig into when it comes to being able to, 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 to take advantage of the speed benefits that actually sending a thousand relevant parts can give you. Um, we teamed up with Wilhelmsen Ship Services. They're the world's largest ship service organization. They're in 2,200 ports around the world. They service about half the world's production fleet, about 27,000 vessels. And for the last two years, we've actually been 3D printing in a test port uh, facility in Singapore, where we've now gone through over a million line items, purchasing history, line by line, looking at product, what can be printed, what can't be printed. Um, we basically discovered that about half of the goods that are being put into um, into the vessels is printable, either now or in the near future. There are certification issues, there are material quality control issues, there's IP issues, there's all kinds of stuff, but it is doable. And we are now basically on a road to digitize 10,000 parts together with Wilhelmsen Ship Services. And we've been actually 3D printing and putting parts on vessels um, now for, for almost a year. So, you know, really the way we envision the future of supply chain working is by essentially having the customer place an order uh, that then gets processed, sent to a local manufacturing center operated by one of our partners, and then the last mile delivery is done and the part is installed on the vessel. And really what it is is the digital inventory. So we've kind of approached this from a slightly non-engineering point of view, I guess you could call it. Pretty much every OEM that we talk to, or every original equipment manufacturer we talk to, when they go into the industry, what they're doing is trying to find the most complex part in their supply chain. And then if they can 3D print that, then everything else works, right? Like it's classic engineering. And it's very solid, because if you can do that, then it's true of the other stuff. We've gone for your button covers, for your gaskets, for all the non-critical stuff, because we believe that integrating in the supply chain is as big of a challenge Figuring out the business models are as big of a challenge as actually just getting the 3D printed parts printed. We believe that a lot of people in this room are able to solve a lot of the other problems for us. So, you know, if just bringing it down to unit economics, what we're seeing is that even though injection molding will probably always be slightly more uh, cost affordable than 3D printing the part, because you're reducing operational cost structures and, and storage and transportation, you're actually able to, to get some pretty significant savings um, 
on average around 65% of the cost of goods today. And so, you know, bringing it down to sort of like reducing that supply chain complexity, what we've been doing now is actually starting to work with other heavy industries as well. So we're working with oil and gas, we're working with mining, we're working with construction, and we're essentially seeing the same pattern repeat itself again and again and again and again. And one of the really interesting things um, that I'm quite excited about right now is that, you know, bringing it back to the sort of centralized manufacturing cycle um, that I started off with with the Ford um, moving, um, moving plant, you know, a car today consists of about 30,000 components. It's quite a complex thing to put together. But if you look at it from an additive manufacturing point of view, it actually uses far fewer technical materials. And the 3D printer doesn't really care whether it's making the same part again and again and again. You can print totally different parts from one instance to the next. It's all a digital manufacturing tool chain. And so if you bring it back to local production, for me, it's not really even about 3D printing. It's about on-demand, point-of-use manufacturing. And it's happening across a range of industries right now. You've got companies like Memphis Meats, 3D printing, you know, uh, or using stem cells to kind of generate uh, artificial meat products. You've got organs being made. You've got local food initiatives being, being, being set up. And it's all really a, a consequence of faster, better, and cheaper production robotics being able to enable these kind of local production tools. Um, there's an interesting study that came out by ING just a couple of years ago um, where they looked at a couple of different scenarios and their conclusion was that about 50% of manufactured goods will be printed in 2060. I like to tell my wife that the key to happiness is lower expectations. Uh, she doesn't always buy that, but you know, I, I don't necessarily buy this statistic either, but I think it is safe to say that a significant amount of the, the, like the world's trade is going to be impacted by this trend. And obviously, we hope to, to be part of it. I think to bring it back up to sort of like a top level, it really is about a number of technologies coming together. And whereas in the past, our entire supply chain has been orientated around manufacturing capabilities in a centralized location, what's happening now is that the number of data points that we can get from a single user, um, this is just what I could get off my cell phone, um, a couple of nights ago. And by the way, just to give you a sense of, uh, this was actually the, my heart rate giving a talk the other day, so that should give you an indication of how happy I am here to be talking to you guys right now. Um, but I like the idea of being able to get that kind of level of data, and really what it brings it back down to is, whereas we used to have to organize everything around how you made stuff, maybe in the future we can organize it around the heartbeats of our users. And I've started to talk about this really in the sense of kind of like heartbeat logistics. It's about the pulse rate of your customers and their customers' customers. And because we're now able to use virtual warehousing, on-demand point-of-use production, and really orientate the entire supply chain based off of the user's needs, um, suddenly you can do convenient and predictable and cost-effective things that just weren't possible before. And um, unlike Brexit, I think I will stop uh, just a little bit ahead of time and, and uh, give it back to you, Jeremy. So thank you very much. So I'm going to, as we've got some time, I'm going to ask a, um, I'm going to ask a question. But also, if you have any questions, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to come to you guys. We haven't got time for, for bashfulness or shyness. If you have a question, stick up your hand, ask the question. Uh, does it, I'll ask you first. Does anybody have a question for, for Ivaldi? Yes, sir. Yeah, there's a microphone coming. Uh, Stefan from Danfoss. We're also a big kind of producing company. Yeah. And what I would like to ask you about is the certification and, and the issues that you briefly touched upon uh, among all the, all the good stuff. We also know that this is really a challenge. And, yeah. and if you're adding a lot of different materials and the oil and gas industry is definitely somebody that is quite high on their standards. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, so the question is around certification. Um, basically, our uh, perspective on it is you really have to take quality into consideration from the get-go. And we have sort of three layers um, uh, of our strategy to that. So first one is we've teamed up with DNVGL. 
So everything that we're doing is getting approved by them. Um, right now, there aren't actually approval systems in the Maritime space to be able to do um, sort of 3D printed parts certification. Those are coming out in December. After that, we'll start doing families of parts. And then our final sort of end goal is to get the algorithmic certification where you can make uh, evolution uh, changes on the fly. And the reason for that is it blows my mind that in supply chain today, when you want to replace a part, you replace it with the exact same part. Why don't we evolve the product instead and make it better than the last time? Yeah. Any other questions at all? Yes, sir. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but quite recently, G, I believe it was G Additive, they, they, uh, they put out a patent on tying blockchain and this spare part services uh, thing together. How do you see the whole IP thing on these kinds of applications of additive systems towards business models? Because that must be a, f a threat on, on some level. It's pretty scary. Yeah. So, so there's definitely, particularly for, for the OEMs, right? Putting your files into the cloud is, is a huge deal. The way we're dealing with it is we're working with you know, big trusted partners in the industry. Wilhelmsen already has delivery deals with a whole bunch of companies. And so you know, by doing it that way and using trusted and, and big you know, established companies in terms of the, the sharing, you still have to consider file security. But because we can do it in a much more closed manner than just putting the files out uh, online for, for anyone to access, um, even though you're trying to secure it, it, it it enables us to do things that, uh, you know, at a higher level of trust than you would get otherwise. Um, Espen, I've got one question for you as right. well. Um, and this is, this is from a layman point of view, which is what I was interested in what you're talking about, mm. is that you know, you're, you're, you're sending the file, having it 3D printed near the location, then transported to the vessel itself. Yeah. Um, at what point did you, did you rule out the possibility of printing the, pro the, the parts actually on the vessel? The moment we realized the crew were on a rotational schedule and didn't give a shit about uh, how the 3D printers uh, were going to be working. So, you know, part of the, part of the problem for, for Maritime and, and a lot of other industries is the end users are continuously actually trying to reduce the amount of people they need out in the field, um, you know, improve efficiencies. And so, you know, for us, we're constantly looking at it. We don't necessarily think that uh, printing in port is going to make sense for everyone. Uh, there are vessels, you know, supply vessels and, and uh, you know, aircraft carriers and stuff where you actually can have a factory on board. But depending on the layout of the equipment and complexity of what you're trying to do, having basically people that come in every day and do the same thing, um, that are operator trained, certified, it just gives you that quality assurance that you really need when breaking into a new industry. Brilliant. Thanks yeah. very much, Jasmine. Really Thanks appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.